of God postponed for a week? Question mark. Kingdom of God postponed for a week? Question mark. Now the question mark is postponed for a week. Yes, that's what the study is about, a week. So you can go ahead and find your way to the book of Daniel. That's the next book after Ezekiel. Daniel. And I'm going to kind of back into our study tonight. We're going to begin in Daniel 9, move quickly, eventually, to Daniel 7, and then on to Daniel 2. So there's, there's reason behind this approach, and you'll see it as, as I take this approach. I want to challenge you to find time to read Daniel 2. Read the whole 12 chapters of Daniel. It's not hard to read. But especially chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 9. And we're going to look in particular in a short while at Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. But before we get there, I need to lay a little groundwork. Uh, and admit again up front that this study in biblical prophecy is not being given by an expert. Someone defined an expert as one who knows more and more about less and less until they know nothing about everything. <laughs> Pastor Brian was talking about the millennium. Someone said the millennium is a thousand years of peace about which Christians have been fighting for for 2,000 years. <laughs> fighting over. So my particular understanding of Bible prophecy is not intended to attack your view or create an argument with you or label fellow believers with derogatory terms but to assert a theological position that I have come to a firm yet teachable persuasion concerning admitting that there's still a lot that, that I don't know and there's a lot that I don't understand but I believe that all those who begin to interpret Scripture from this perspective that, that, that I've come to embrace will begin to be surprised, stunned, exhilarated, and emboldened as they realize they are themselves called to be co-partners in the family firm of Almighty and Son's Kingdom Enterprises Universal. In other words, simply known as the Kingdom of God. Not postponed, but here and now. Not like it's going to eventually be, but present, powerfully, here and now. Simple definition of kingdom. Uh, one, uh, Graham Goldsworthy defines the kingdom this way, I like it. And that is, God's people, write this down, kingdom. God's people, in God's place, under God's rule. God's people, in God's place, under God's rule. Jim Hilton says, Kingdom, King Jesus on the move. That's pretty good. Under the domain of the King, under the Lordship of the King of Glory. However, I'm very much aware that the most popular, well-known teaching on Bible prophecy in America is done from a position called dispensational premillennialism. This is a relatively new and novel interpretation beginning from around 1830. It has become so widely held and taught that anyone who dares question this position, this interpretation, is given pejorative names such as anti-Semitic, replacement or super cessationism theology, robbers of Israel, etc., etc., etc. I've been called all of those. Radio personality and author Hank Hanegraaff commented from personal experience on these things that I'm talking about. The, 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 the unkind words that have been said about people like him and like myself. Here's what he said, quote, Those who dare question the notion of a pre-tribulational rapture followed by a Holy Land Holocaust in which the vast majority of Jews perish are shouted down as peddlers of godless heresy. The ultimate majority phrase has even been coined for those who deny the heart of dispensational eschatology. 
They are dubbed, quote, replacement theologians and are said to be guilty of spreading the message of anti-Semitism. And if you don't know what that is, it means hatred of the Jews and being against the Jews. Popular dispensationalists such as John Hagee, who's very blunt, very belligerent in his denunciation, said this, and I'm quoting him. Replacement theologians are now carrying Hitler's anointing and his message. How about that? Is that kind? Is that generous to someone who's involved in a very controversial issue to begin with to declare on, on, on international television and through his written material that anyone who believes basically what I believe is carrying Hitler's anointing and his message. Now that's unkind. You say you shouldn't have mentioned my name. No, it's not unkind to mention somebody that's already mentioned you by name. These are indeed uncharitable remarks made by those who say that God has, listen to this, two distinct people, two distinct plans, two distinct destinies, and two ways of salvation. One dispensational website has, there is a demonic cancer coursing through the life blood of the church of Jesus Christ and its name is replacement theology. You say, what in the world? Is that must be bad if everybody's against it. What it means is it's a, it's a false uh, criticism that says anybody who does not hold their position believes that Israel has been replaced by the church. That God has no purpose for them. But it's, that's not good theology in any respect because in my humble opinion of the understanding of Scripture, God has always had only one plan, one way of salvation, one people, and that's not two different people with two different plans, one heavenly and one earthly, but one people, one olive tree according to Romans chapter 11, and that begins with the root of Abraham and goes up and, and, and we have been grafted in as Gentiles, but there's not two olive trees, there's only one olive tree, and it's the people of God, Old Testament, New Testament, all combined to make one glorious people of God under the Lordship and Saviorship of Jesus Christ, who is the only Savior of men. Amen. And that's the position. And that's all replacement theology. So please, please, please pay close attention to what I'm about to say. I'm going to skip over a lot of it here like I always do. Um, but hear this if you don't hear anything else. Next to the centrality and supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, there are two terms that dominate Scripture. Jesus is the predominant one and the predominant person of Scripture. But here are the two terms right from now. Covenant and kingdom. Covenant and kingdom. You cannot hope to understand Scripture without understanding something about covenant. Because the whole scripture is about covenant and God being a covenant cutting, covenant keeping God. In fact, this is a complete Bible, and, but it's divided into two parts. We call Old Covenant, Old Testament, and New Testament. Now, each is not separate and unrelated. It's an unfolding drama of redemption that reaches its consummation in the person of Jesus Christ. So that the Old Covenant is headed toward Him in shadows, and then the Son, S-O-N, comes out, and everything then that has come to Him and pointed to Him, now flows out of Him, so that He's the central and the supreme person of the entire universe and of the Bible as well. This is the Jesus book. So, covenant, and then here's the other Here's the other word, kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven. Now what's happened is both of those terms have, have been misunderstood, misconstrued, misapplied, confused, and contested throughout church history. Especially the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And as a result of that, those who hold a particular view of the kingdom that has been postponed, that it only exists now in some kind of mystery form that does not really have that much effect upon culture 
and, 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 and the world as a whole and cannot really be considered the reign of Jesus until he actually, literally, physically, visibly and bodily sits all an earthly thought. That there's no king. That's the teaching of the position known as dispensational premillennialism. Now let me tell you again, if you've embraced that and you know that, wonder. You probably have a Bible and has footnotes. If you have any of the Ryrie Study Bible, Charles Stanley Study Bible, um, um, name any of them, any, any of them, Wade Trimmer Study Bible. <laughs> I haven't read it yet. You'll never see a Bible with Wade Trimmer's footnotes in it, okay? Uh, the best thing that happened to me, I gave up the footnotes of the Bible and just got a Bible, a good reference Bible. That, that's, that's without the footnotes. But you're, you're, you, if you hold that position, you're in a majority. If you watch guys on television, you're in a majority. And, and some of these are great guys. I love them dearly. I respect them. I admire them. But I respectfully disagree with them. And, and, and also can, can see, in, in some respects, how detrimental this particular view of history and of salvation is, is, is having upon society as a whole. Now, so, uh, there are different responses uh, based upon how one embraces this, this position. But here, here's, here's the basic position that, that I'm refuting, that I once held, that I was taught, uh, that I taught myself, that I preached for 20 years. And that is this position that Jesus came to offer himself as a king to Israel. They rejected him outright and crucified him. And when they did, the kingdom was postponed. Now there's a mystery form in which he's in heaven reigning sort of, but he doesn't really reign. He just kind of like the, 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 uh, the, the king and queen of England. They, 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 they reign, but they don't rule. You know, this kind of figure here. In other words, this position says basically that the whole world is under the control of the evil one, the devil. You say, well, the scripture says that. No, it doesn't. The scripture says that the world system lies under the control of the evil one. But he doesn't own the world nor rule the world. This is my Father's world. He is ruling and reigning. Jesus is not going to be king. He is king now. Amen. He's not waiting to rule only at the period in which he sits on a literal throne slicing and dicing anyone who disagrees with him. He's ruling now. In my understanding. But this particular position says that, they, that Jesus offered a literal kingdom they rejected. Well, that's, that's not biblical because in John chapter 6, I, I have that verse so we don't have to turn there. John chapter 6 verse 15. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. If that's what he came to offer, why did he say, Here I am. this is what I came for, get it ready, we're going to get it on. That's not why he came. He didn't offer them a, a literal, political a physical type kingdom in which the rope, the, the yoke of Rome would be broken, Israel would be exalted to a place of absolute sovereignty and control and, and have the favor of Messiah. He never offered anything like that. But the teaching says he did. And as a result, he was crucified. And then that put a postponement on the prophetic clock and it stopped for an extended period of time. In fact, a long period, on down to 2,000 now, but in 48, the clock started running again. And, and, and within that generation, which is how 1988 and all those other days came to mind, within one generation of when Israel was back in the land, then the final week of human history will be initiated and established. And during that week, first of all, the church is raptured. Now this is debatable. Some say it's the mid, some say it's the end. But the teaching still says the church eventually gets raptured and it gets raptured because everybody that's saved is going to be saved during this period of time. And then the church, after all, has basically failed because if you look at the Revelation chapter 2 and 3 with the churches, the last condition of the church is lay out a sin age, and that means the church is lukewarm. Jesus is on the outside trying to get in, and all we can look for is a remnant that are going to be snatched out and taken away. 
Again, in my humble opinion, that's a very, very, very destructive method of approaching Scripture. That's not what that is all about, in my opinion, at all. But nevertheless, so that week, that seven-year period, finally is initiated. A man comes on the scene who's the head of a revived Roman Empire. Now take notice of this. Everything that happens in this particular position has to have a, a mosaic restorationism and a Roman restoration. In other words, you've got to go back to the events that were already in place in the first century. You've got to have a quote, revived Roman Empire. Uh, you, you've got to have a federation of nations of which the leader is going to be called the Antichrist. You've got to have Israel in the nation. You've got to have the temple built. You've got to have priests in place. You've got to have animal sacrifices taking place. The Antichrist comes on the scene. He makes a peace covenant with Israel. And in the middle of that, he breaks that agreement and begins to persecute them. The whole world is in a great conflagration. Millions of people are dying everywhere and every place. And especially in the Jewish community because according to them, Zechariah 13, 8, two-thirds of them will die right there because of that. He'll break a third through that refining fire. And then at the end, he'll come back and be the battle of Armageddon. He'll smash them and dice them and slice them and set up his literal throne. And he'll be there for a thousand years where all of those will be reigning with him that survive. And, and, and then there will be uh, peace for a thousand years. So what's wrong with that? Well, in my humble opinion, it has nothing to do with Scripture. Mm -hmm. Nothing. You say you're being unkind. No, I'm not being unkind. I'm just telling you, in my humble opinion, that is not at all what Scripture teaches. Not at all. All right, so now having said that, having, having uh, already told you what basically you believe, <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I believe. <laughs> nothing like having somebody tell you what you believe. Well, if you believe this sensational preaching, I'm not just talking what you believe. And, and if you think, I can give you details of that. I, just, I had the charts, man. I even got screen there. I've even got some of them who've been here. Small, you can't see them. This is the beast in chapter 2, the metal man. And he's got toes. They're long. They're stretched out. 2,000 years total. Because the king has been postponed. They're not here. Well, that's if you believe it. What you believe, that's what you believe. <laughs> so, uh, let me show you what let me show you what impact this has. I, I believe honestly, and, and I'm not depreciating anyone's impact because these men, most of them, had far more impact than I would ever have. I understand, but that doesn't make it right. Has God used them? Yes, but He's used them in spite of these things. Here's what has happened, in my opinion. And that is, there has been a cultural abandonment. So that if the kingdom is not here, the best we can hope for is to save a few souls and get them off of this sinking Titanic and into heaven and Jesus can come back and do what Jesus does. The interesting thing in John 14, Jesus said, it's to your advantage that I go away, not come, but that I go away. Because when I go back, I'm going to send one back just like me, the Holy Spirit, and He'll do what I would not and could not do when I was here. Because when He comes back, He still can't be but one place at one time. Why? Because He's in a glorified body. You say, well, Jesus said, no, 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 no. He's in a glorified body. Manifestations that, 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 that give the, the, the awareness of Jesus is in the person of the Holy Spirit. He's just like Jesus, third person of the Trinity without a body. And He can be everywhere present at the same time. So according to Jesus, we have the advantage over those who had Him by their side. Listen to this. Jesus inside is better than Jesus beside. Amen. That's right. Let me say that again. Jesus inside in the Holy Spirit is better than Jesus beside. Amen. Now, that's... That's my understanding of what Jesus said. But now listen to this statement. Dr. John MacArthur said, quote, Reclaiming the culture is a pointless, futile exercise. I'm convinced that we're living in a post-Christian society, a civilization that exists under God's judgment. And here's his final statement. Getting people saved is our only agenda. It's the only thing that we're in the world to do. 
So if it's predetermined prophetically that things are going to, from bad to worse, the tendency is, what's the point? If this is the way it's going to be, then I'll be hindering the purposes of God by doing anything that will retard the continued deterioration of society and culture. So we have what we have. An abandonment as a whole of the, of the material, arguing that, that, that all that matters is the spiritual and getting the soul saved for heaven. Now, I believe in going to heaven. It's the only place, uh, one of two places that you can go when you die. You either go to hell or you go to heaven. But heaven is, listen, let me, let me throw out something else, another hand grenade into your theology. Heaven is not the final home of God's people. You're not going to be like an angel. I hate people telling you that. Mama died, now she's an angel. No, she's not an angel. Baby died, he now has wings. No, he doesn't have wings. Babies don't become angels. People don't become angels. Angels are angels, and they've always been angels, except what's become evil angels, and they're now demons. So angels are angels. Bad theology to say somebody had become an angel. But we're not going to be up there with the angels singing and playing hearts. I don't even think it's the people who can sing. You know what I mean? I can't think of anything more boring. I've been seeing music all my the entire day. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the assignment just begins here as we begin to learn what it's like to operate on the new earth and perhaps extend this to the, to the ends of the universe. Who knows? But it, you won't be bored. And you won't be sitting around all the time. I appreciate people who say, all we're going to do is be worshiping. That's a misunderstanding of what worship is. We think worship is singing and bowing and doing all those things. So we just go around all the time and say, oh, no, no. No, we enjoy such glorious presence of God that we're able to partner with Him in whatever He wants to partner with us. Amen. Well, that, that does me good. But dead men, heaven is for dead men. Earth is for living men and women. You're here now on assignment. Not to get to heaven as quick as you can. If you don't want to go there as quick as you can, if you do, just come up, sit right here, and I pray God will kill you tonight and take you to heaven. Oh, as soon as you feel the pain, you're going to go to the doctor's home. Oh, isn't that bad? No. And he made a point. Daniel has been taken captive 
Uh, he's been there a long time, and they were to be in exile for 70 years. Why? Well, because they never observed the Sabbath rest that God said the land was to be given. That means every seven years from the time Israel was given the Holy Land, the Promised Land, every seven years was to be a Sabbath year of rest. On the seventh year, they were not to till the land, let it rest. They never did it. God never did anything, really. They just let them go. Seven hundred, four hundred and ninety years passed, and God said, Bang. This is the judgment for not letting my land rest and granting the Sabbath rest. So, they went into exile for seventy years. One year for every seven. That's how the seventy came about. So Daniel knew that they were there and were going to be in exile for 70 years. And that time was coming to a conclusion in chapter 9. So he began to inquire about the future for his people, the, the Israelites. That's what he was concerned for, his people. So he begins by prayer. It's a great prayer open in chapter 9. And then he gets revelation. The, 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 the angel comes, the angel of the Lord comes and begins to give revelation to him. And, and here's, how, here's what it says. Um, now while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sins, he says, Gabriel, verse 21. Gabriel came and he began to interpret. Drop down to verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Your people, Israelites. Your holy city, Jerusalem. Actually, if you look out in your margin, if you have a good reference Bible, it should say 77s. That's, that's what it is. It's 77. These are weeks. But these are actually weeks of years. And that's nothing new. Just write down uh, in, in your notes, Genesis 29, verses 27 and 28, where you'll find that Jacob had to work seven years to get Rachel for his wife, but then got deceived and wound up the next morning in the room with Leah and then said, I didn't bargain for this. And the man said, well, here we observe God's order. Things not like you tripping the people around. So here's the deal. You can have Rachel, but you're going to have to, you're going to, have to work another seven years. And he said, I'm glad to finish that week. You find it says a week, and it's usually more than that one reference. So each of these, each of these represent weeks of years. So we're talking about a total of 490 years that deal with the exile and the return and then the destruction of the holy city. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And they give six things that are going to happen to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. Seven weeks equaling forty-nine years. Seven times seven. Sixty-two weeks. You add those two together, you get sixty-nine, and you come up with four hundred and eighty-three years. That's not hard to calculate. He said after four hundred and eighty-three years, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And then notice, here's a big, big, big preposition. And after the 62 weeks plus the 7, that's 69, after 69 weeks, after 69 weeks, where are you? You're in week 70. I mean, you don't have to be a, a, a Hebrew scholar to figure out after 69 weeks, 69, 70. So you're already in the 70th week when this happens. Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. That word cut off, if you know anything about Old Testament, it means to die violently, to be put to death and suffer the death penalty. Over and over again, the scripture talks about being cut off. So this is a violent cutting off of Messiah the Prince. And then he says, and the people of the Prince. Now, my particular scripture has Prince Capital. Not that that's inspired, but it's interesting because it reveals how they understood this. 
the, the translator. Verse 25, the Prince, the Messiah, capitals. But then here, and the people of the Prince, lowercase, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, that's Jerusalem and the city, uh, or rather the temple, the, Jerusalem, the city, and the temple, and the end of it shall be with a flood, and until the end of the war, desolations are determined, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. On the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. You say, what in the world is all that? And I'm glad you asked. I'm, I'm going to try to help you get a better understanding of what this is all about. You see, here's the key. Here's the key. Dr. John Walford, former president of Dallas Seminary, said John, Daniel chapter 9 is the most important passage in Scripture as far as prophecy is concerned. But others, Dr. Dwight Pentecost, Dr. Alvin McLean, founder of Grace Theological Seminary, says the whole of biblical prophecy hinges on this particular understanding of this passage in Daniel chapter 9. Why? Because this is the only place you're going to find this week. So I know it's in Revelation. Well, I'll show you when we get there, if we ever get there, that it is not a week. It's three and a half years that are used there. But because of this kind of pattern, you have to force all those together to make it come out to be seven. And it's called this particular week. That, we, this, that the dispensational position calls Daniel's 70th, the, the 70th week of Daniel's, the seven year of tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, etc., etc. Now look at your notes. The timeline of Christ's week's work. First of all, the relatively new view. That's the dispensational premillennial view. You have a picture there from an architect named Clarence Larkin of years gone by. And the picture of that person there, that's the statue, that's the man that Daniel saw in chapter 2. It's a, it's a metal man. He's got a gold head that represented Nebuchadnezzar. He, he's got a silver chest. He's got bronze or whatever the metals are, and then he's got iron, and he goes all the way down to feet of clay. And this represents four empires, four kingdoms that rule the known world. Now listen closely. There is not another one in my opinion. There's not going to be a fifth. There's not going to be an eighth. The fifth kingdom is already established. And that is the kingdom of the Messiah, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to show you that if I have time in Daniel chapter 2 where a stone is cut without hands and slaps this image and it's not smiting the toes of something 2,000 years later. How in the world have we ever come up with 2,000 years when it could have been 20,000 years or etc.? Well, that's another whole discussion. But here's a position. Notice closely. Seven weeks. That is, 49 years there was a decree. From the time of the decree found in uh, Nehemiah chapters 3 through 6, from the decree that went forth for the Jews to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, there was a period of seven weeks or 49 years. From that time, you count 62 weeks according to this view, and this is where Jesus was rejected and crucified, and the prophetic clock stopped, the time stopped, Time's not being counted, and there is a gap. And into that gap came a mystery called the church. Totally unknown, a surprise, but that's not true at all. It was not totally unknown. It was not a surprise. But here's this gap, and that gap is called basically another people, it's called the church. And when the church age is finished, then they'll be taken out of the way. And God will put back online His primary goal, plan A, the original plan. And this will precipitate in seven years of tribulation. So here's what you have. 49 years, and then the, the place is rebuilt. The city is rebuilt. Uh, the temple is rebuilt. And then all the way up to 483 years at that period, according to this, Jesus is crucified, rejected, crucified, Raised goes back to heaven, and the church age is now in existence. And will continue to be so until it's taken out of the way, and then the main thing becomes the main thing again. Now, I mean, I'm caricaturing and exaggerating a little bit, not much, but a little bit. Because that's, again, the general position. Now, here's the second one. I call this the standard literal view, and it has been so for centuries, literally hundreds and hundreds and almost 
2,000 years. And that is that these simply interpreted literally without anybody's footnotes, without a presuppositional dispensational premillennial scheme, without that you approach these and it just simply reveals that these are consecutive weeks. That the time can be calculated almost to the, to the, to the very moment in which all of this happened and then during that seven weeks, which is already in the past, ultimately, listen, in the middle of that week, Jesus was violently put to death. He had three and a half years of public ministry. He was publicly put to death. He rose again. And there on the cross, when he cried, Tetelestai, it is finished. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, which was God saying, the shadow has now become the substance. The, 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 the rituals and the, the things that this picture has now become a reality in the person of my son and there will never be another building that have my stamp of approval upon it. There will never be another animal that dies that has my stamp of approval upon it. There will never be another high priest that has my stamp of approval upon it because my son, the prince of all prince, the Messiah, one and only, has come and done what he was predestined to do and as a result of that, there's only and only it has ever been one way of salvation. So you can take all of this stuff. Listen, you can you can agree, fine. You can disagree. Many of you do. It's fine. I, I won't argue with you. I, I won't say, well, brother so and so, he has statues as big as this building. I don't care if he has them, that it takes a 747 to bring them in on. I don't care what books are being written. I'm telling you, if you want a literal interpretation based on scripture, just interpret this literally. And that is that this took place over a period of 490 years and found this exact fulfillment in the Messiah. Okay, now let's look. I only got less than 10 minutes. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> How do I ever get in these places like this? Now, now listen again. The Bible says nothing about an Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9. You've got to read that in from somewhere else. You, you won't find that there. You've got to go somewhere else to get that. Men have added this. The Bible doesn't say anything about a gap between 69 and 70. Because there's not one. This is not, there's not one scripture that teaches that God will ever reject grace in Jesus' blood and return to His law and animal sacrifices to atone for men's sin. The Bible teaches in Galatians that the law was given because of transgression. Galatians 3.19. So this shows that the law was the parenthesis in God's plan and not Jesus' new covenant. There's not one scripture in the Bible for a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. The Bible teaches the last day resurrection of all. There's not one scripture in the Bible for a future seven-year period of tribulation. None. You say there is. I can prove it. Well, once you buy me the best lunch in town, we'll spend all afternoon, and I'll, 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 I'll debate you. I'll do whatever you want to do. And in the end, you'll go away probably still disbelieving, and I'll go away still convinced that that, that I have come to a halfway clear understanding of this. And it does make a difference. Now listen, time is up. We'll come back next time out here, okay? This is just too much. Next time I won't have to do all this preliminary stuff. You'll already come in mad and ready for it. <laughs> I'll just start from right there and it will unfold this. I want you to see this. I want you to see that the kingdom of God is here. Yeah. It's yeah. not here like it's going to be, but it's here. And the king is ruling and reigning. And he will continue. Listen, you know how long he's going to reign? He's seated at the right hand of the Father in the place of supreme authority. And he will sit there until all of his enemies become his footstool. He won't get up and come back and by force cause people to obey. He will through his gospel, through his kingdom announcement, through his kingdom ambassadors, through the love of God, through the grace of God, through the mercy of God, and not through the force of God and the force of swords, but through love He will bring a people from every tongue and tribe and kindred. And so you can relax and build for the future because the prospects of that future are as bright as the promises of God. And they all find their yes and amen in one glorious person. His name is Jesus Christ. This is not a book about Jews. This is not a book about Israel. This is not a book about the church. They're all there, but they all find their answer and full revelation in the glorious person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fulfiller of all the promises, all the provisions found in this glorious Messiah, 
who is the one who established the covenant, sent the other prince and his people to destroy, just like he said there won't be one stone left of them another. Now let me just read you. I got five minutes. I'm going to read you a quick testimony. I'll show you how this affects me. I've never seen a young man in such bondage. Some of you read this in my weekly mail. His name is John Moody. He's a great guy. Went with me in 20, 2010 on his first mission trip. That was the setup. But he lived in what I call the Christian intensive scary. Let me say that again. The Christian intensive scary. That is, his eschatology was crippling his life and limiting his usefulness in the kingdom of God. I just can write a testimony. Here's what he said. I'm just going to read part of it. I'd like to give a brief personal testimony concerning how biblical prophecy has impacted my life. I was raised in a Baptist church in Panama City, Florida. And I've sat under sound biblical preaching and teaching since I was a little up to He said, my mother was a spiritual leader. She always taught me along these lines of dispensationalism. He said, I remember during my high school year getting exposed to Jack Benny, Howlings, and Tim LaHaye and their teaching. I was captivated by them. I remember the excitement in seeing that I, what I thought was real Bible prophecy being played out in the morning paper that was being delivered to my parents' driveway. As the years rolled on, I developed a listening ear. Anytime the television was on, heard Israel of the Middle East mention. I remember the surge of excitement and thinking the rapture could be just around the corner. We're going to be escorted out of here with front row seats to watch Jesus keep Satan's tail as we cheer him on. As high school years rolled into adult years, I, I had a natural desire to have a spouse and a family. It was as if I developed a split personality. One part of my personality was consumed with the imminent rapture of the church and the chaos that was soon to follow. Yet the other part of my personality desired to settle down, have a wife, a family, and grandchildren one day. I knew that if I were to get married and have children, it'd take time, time I thought we don't have. I remember the anxiety and despair. I remember thinking that God was cheating me out of life. Asking myself, why couldn't I have lived in a different time than this? I also had aspirations to give my life holy for Christ, living for His glory in the gospel. But those aspirations were always cloudy and murky. I was always burdened. How many years I'd wasted it, knowing that we only had just a few months, maybe minutes to go before the rapture. I read the entire Red Behind series and knew for a fact that this was how things were going to play out. I was convinced it was only a short matter of time that the church would disappear, planes would crash into the sky, cars would crash into each other, and all hell was soon to break loose on earth. I became glued to my computer screen, reading prophecy news reports, even getting up to many emails on my smartphone, the latest developments. When I saw that, he said, excuse me just a minute. I just got the latest, latest email. Now, did, did you know uh, the, the buzzer are reproducing 10 times more than they wanted to do? <laughs> you know, I'm not exactly right. He said it was around the year 2012 when God gave me the opportunity to go on my first mission trip. It was during that trip that I met a man, a man named Wade Trevor, who for the first time in my life challenged my views on this or not. I never heard such things. However, I didn't immediately give up my current view, but during the course of three years, this man generally and biblically challenged this doctrine of dispensational pre-millennialism that I also do. He sent me books directing the teachers of the Word who had different views. He taught me to read the Bible differently. It encouraged me to engage in the fight and contend for and share the gospel, make disciples of all people groups. He said, I remember his words to me on more than one occasion. He has, he, 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 as he said, what's the point of going in business if you're going out of business tomorrow? And then he goes on and says, Eventually, with convictions, I repented of my obsession with escapism and neglect of any Christian mandate to make disciples and make disciples of all nations. It encourages me to think that when Christ returns, and I do believe He's returning, He will return to an all conquering all pervading all beautiful bride. And He says, I have been set free from the fear and the bondage that this is the last minute, and the best we can do is just a hasty patch-up job on something that's going to sink and burn anyway. So that's just one of the testimonies, one of the many testimonies. I'm telling you, it does make a difference. How what you perceive your future to be will determine what you receive, how much you achieve in the rest. You can't hold this, you can't hold this dichotomous view 
and believe that Jesus will come before morning, but there's a bright future ahead on earth for hundreds and maybe thousands of years to come you cannot do it because you don't really believe that. If the doctor told you you had a month to live, it would make a difference in the way you live. You say, I believe God, but you still could make a difference in the way you view life. You would be planning on getting married, increasing your bank account, and doing all these things. It does matter. It does matter. Here's one thing I do know if Jesus cares. You're going to die. <laughs> you think that's a bad deal? No. Everybody before us, the biggest of us, have died. And it's only in American Christianity, for the most part, in this present moment, that talks in terms of getting out of this. Even if you go for it, I don't, I don't believe that there's that. There may be something 10,000 times worse than I can imagine, but it's not a seven week period called the Great Tribulation. I'm telling you, in my understanding, that's history, that's access. No, look unto Jesus. Don't be talking about the special. People talk about a special person. Don't be talking about what's happening here. Talk about what He's already done. Don't talk about what's going to happen at the second coming. Get focused on what He did at the first coming. And that will liberate you to life. And you can get on with life and begin to believe in a younger generation and begin to tell them, you know what? I want you to get married and have kids. In fact, I want you to have a dud. Praise God. Because Muslims believe in the future. They're having dozens and we're losing by default because we don't want to have children because we want it as easy as we can because we want to bring them into this mess. Well, you'll not have to take this word off the yard because I'm not going to put that word in again. But, you know, that word is... That word is... Thank you so much for the comments.